Welcome everyone. You have arrived at the Cybers Focus Forum webinar on extending and automating the Cybers platform using the Cybers SDK. Uh, today's pr uh, presentation will be uh, given by John Fauner, who's part of the Cybers team based at TAC and UT Austin. And uh, before we start, I just need to go over a quick bit of housekeeping. Please, if you have not yet done it, uh, turn on your chat feature. Our webinar uh, application only allows you to type in questions. So if there are questions while John is giving his presentation, I will interrupt him with his permission and he can address the questions. Otherwise, he can save them for the end. Um, we are recording and so this webinar will be uploaded to the wiki page that's listed on the chat. And we'll also be sending a follow-up survey to ask for your input on how to improve our, our webinars. Um, and if you have suggestions for other webinars, we're happy to take those as well. So without further ado, uh, welcome, John. The floor is all yours. Great. Thanks, Tina. Uh, so welcome. Um, and again, my name is John Fauner. I'm a part of the Texas Advanced Computing Center in the Life Sciences Computing Group. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being on the Cybers project for um, almost seven years now and uh, am involved as well in the Agave side of things, which is a, an API <coughs> um, that is part of, you know, one of the things that the Cybers SDK uh, sort of um, includes and wraps around to, to provide an interface to. Um, and is also kind of one of the main mechanisms for extending the Cybers API to include resources outside of those that are existing. So I will talk uh, a little bit about the SDK and what we're going to do, kind of the, the layout for what we want to do. Um, first of all, the SDK that I'll be covering is a, a Bastion Python toolkit that is used for working with the APIs. Uh, and these are the same APIs that the, the web app um, and, and other pieces of the infrastructure interact with. And really the goal of this is to enable developers and enable power users to have a fairly user-friendly, it's still command line, but uh, an accessible way to interact with um, commands that, that make uh, running apps, um, looking at data, uh, even interacting with systems and adding new systems, something that can be done consistently in a, in a programmatic way. And um, <coughs> within that context, people can sort of you know, make out of uh, Cyverse, what, what they're looking for. Um, if, if you're following along, then kind of things that I will assume as we go along is one is passing familiarity with the command line uh, and some sort of access to a terminal app. Um, I'm going to be showing things on a Mac. If you're on a Linux machine, it'll be very analogous. Um, if you're on a Windows machine and running the bash kernel, which is an option in Windows 10, then it'll also be pretty similar. Um, if, if you don't have one of those options, you know, a lot of times you can use PuTTY and just log into a development machine that, that you have and, and do the same things. So the requirements are relatively modest. Uh, we are going to talk about containers, and this is kind of a, a really fun development pattern that we like to promote. So it, it makes the most sense to have Docker installed in your development environment. Uh, there are other paths forward for using containers in your, in your apps and um, using containers to sort of uh, add code into the infrastructure. Um, and then the last thing that we're going to be doing is we need, you know, we're showing how to extend the, the infrastructure. So uh, we're going to use Atmosphere. Um, Atmosphere is actually part of Cyverse, but you can uh, spool up a virtual machine on there and we'll show how to add that machine into, uh, you know, as an execution host and then use it from the discovery environment or from the, the command line. And um, this really is a model for how you might add any uh, machine. So if you have a, a campus cluster that you want to use, but you want to use um, it as part of a, a Cyverse workflow, or if you want to use it through the interface of the discovery environment, uh, this is how you would go about that. So this is sort of a layout of the Cyverse product stack. Um, a lot of times we call this the cyber infrastructure. We say that we're a cyber infrastructure project. If infrastructure is the roads and the highways and the electricity, upon which we can build neighborhoods and, and cities, uh, then cyber infrastructure is the networking and the disk storage and the, the compute uh, upon which we can build scientific communities um, and, and really support entire fields of science. And so we approach this in a way 
that's as open-handed as possible. And really, uh, Cyverse users have access all up and down the stack to, to what they want to use and what's most helpful to them. Um, today, kind of the, the most common things that we'll be looking at is atmosphere and the discovery environment. Um, these are really user-facing web-based uh, portals that have a high degree of ease of use. Um, and they're built on top of uh, all this lower level services to enable what they do. Um, the other piece that we're going to be showing is essentially the science APIs, and we're going to be interacting with them directly using the, the Cybers SDK. Um, but just to go over kind of the broader spectrum of, of things, we have a number of interfaces that are uh, built on top of this infrastructure, including a number of powered by uh, Cybers or powered by iPlant. Uh, third-party people who are, are just using the same type of authentication or API framework to really build their own front-end web portal and serve a whole new community that, that is related to their field of science and their research interests. Um, but under, underneath these, we have the data store. Um, we'll be using this. Uh, this is you know, a big IRODS data store that's uh, also replicated to a location TAC, so it's both TAC and Arizona. It's a great place to centrally host data and be able to share that in a very fine-grained way with other collaborators. Um, the science APIs, <coughs> we'll be looking mostly at Agave, um, but there are a lot of APIs that are inside there. There are APIs for interacting with atmosphere. Uh, there are APIs that interact with um, the discovery environment and the apps that are listed in there, and then the APIs for Agave I'll, I'll demonstrate. Um, when we log in, no matter how we log in with these places, we're going to be using the same authentication framework. Uh, we won't touch much on Elasticsearch, but if you use the discovery environment, you'll definitely notice this. And underneath it all are kind of these lower level services. Um, you know, IRODS is a, a big one. It's the, the data stores file system is using IRODS. And uh, if you know, there's a, a toolkit for interacting with that natively, um, but we'll see that the science APIs can also get at those files and, and do uploads and downloads um, through the APIs as well. And um, we'll go from there. The, the last thing I want to sort of express on this slide is that Cyverse provides a number of um, hardware resources for users. And those resources really go a long way. We have, uh, you know, Condor cluster. We uh, leverage the supercomputing resources at TAC, uh, namely Lone Star 5 and, and Stampede, though there are some apps you would never know it. They're in the discovery environment. There are some apps that use Wrangler, which is a data-intensive computing system that's um, really uh, a very neat uh, setup using uh, um, lots and lots of terabytes of flash storage to make the I.O. a lot faster. Um, and then for databases, we have a couple that are, that are back there, and obviously storage, uh, we do a lot of that, um, including IRODs, but including others. And if you have other resources, other data sources that you want to add to Cyverse or other um, computational systems that you want to use, uh, there are many groups that have enrolled those into the Cyverse uh, cyber infrastructure and are using those, and, and this is pretty much the path forward on that. So, um, we're going to, for today, we're going to try and do four things within this little 50 minutes. Um, be a little bit gracious toward me. This is going to be a live demo, which is the absolute cardinal sin when um, doing any, any sort of webinar like this. Uh, but, and hopefully I've sort of paved the way to smooth things out. But the general flow of this is, first of all, we're going to have some sort of execution machine that we want to add into Agave. In this case, I'll show you an Atmosphere VM uh, that I've already gotten booted up. And if you want to follow along, you could do that uh, yourself and, and show that it works. And then we'll register that with Agave using the Cybers SDK. The second thing we'll do is we will use Docker <coughs> to build a, a, just a toy image classifier app. Um, this is a script that is on the, the TensorFlow GitHub page. Uh, but you can give it an image of a cat or a dog or whatever, and it will come back and make predictions on, on what is contained in your image. Uh, based on um, training using the, the ImageNet sort of uh, model. Um, so we'll, we'll explore that locally, which is, if I were a developer, this is how I'd start. In fact, this is how I started for, for this example, uh, to do it locally and get it working. From there, we would deploy that app with an Agave. Uh, and in this case, we're going to tell it to run on our Atmosphere VM. And then once that's all registered in there, we should be able to discover that within the discovery environment 
um, to kind of bring us full loop, just to show that this, uh, the CLI is both a programmatic way to interact with the resources, um, but it's also can just be a means toward extending things and then continuing to use uh, a web interface or, or some other interface. Um, so containers may be new to some people, uh, but essentially the, the idea is, is this. Um, software always has some set of requirements to run. There are some assumptions that people have made for their program. And if you're used to installing, uh, you know, just apps like Chrome or like something like that on a machine, then they have some compiled binary that makes assumptions based on the operating system. And then the operating system is in charge of sort of providing the, the compatibility there. Um, when you go into the scientific space, it's usually not as easy as installing Chrome or something like that. Uh, the, there are expectations in the code about, you know, what libraries you have available or, um, you know, how you'll access it. Um, just, it can be all sorts of things. And especially in the scientific space, what we find is that <laughs> these, uh, it, th that it can be difficult to install a new piece of software somewhere. Um, it, it could be that it uses a lot of libraries that you're unfamiliar with. It could be, be that it uses a build process that is uh, also completely new, that you have to build it from source, you can't just install it. And so the idea of containers is to take all the, the entire recipe for installing an app, including installing all of its dependencies, and to package that into, uh, in the case of Docker, it's sort of a layered file, uh, but you can think of it conceptually as, as one file. Then Docker itself is a runtime, uh, so you can install it on uh, Windows, it'll use a VM to actually accomplish that, but it runs sort of native in Mac and native on Linux, and uh, it's, it's pretty user-friendly to install that on your local machine um, or have it installed on some other development machine. But the idea is that any app that has been dockerized or containerized uh, can run on any machine that has the docker runtime and this has been huge in the scientific space um, this this sort of overcomes a lot of the portability problem uh, that happens uh, which is a big contributing factor to the reproducibility problem in uh, in science and in, in computer science which i've actually seen a couple of recent articles on uh, it's still very much a thing we need to focus on so that's sort of uh, Docker. Docker is a way to take your app and its, or some software and its dependencies and put it uh, all in one place. So rather than having to install everything piece by piece, you can run it in one fell swoop and move it somewhere else and have an expectation that it'll run the same way. So uh, I'll mention that for some apps, and we're not going to do this today, but if you're doing this and wanting to run a container on a high performance computing system, there's some limitations to using Docker. So Docker, uh, as of the time of this video, has kernel requirements that are sometimes newer than what HPC systems support. And there are also some security vulnerabilities that in general, no system administrator that's running a large shared cluster is willing to accept uh, those vulnerabilities. Um, and so Docker is uh, really a non-starter. Um, however, the concept of containerization is not Docker. Docker is one implementation. Uh, there are many others. Um, there's uh, Singularity is the one I'll, I'll refer to here because that's what's supported at, at TAC. There's also one called Charlie Cloud. Uh, there's another runtime called UDocker, which is kind of a user space Docker. And uh, those are all options that, that would work inside of an HPC context. But if you have an app that needs high performance computing resources, you can still develop it on your laptop uh, go through a conversion step, which we have a, a script to do it. Um, in many cases, though, Singularity can just pull the Docker file directly um, if, if uh, you know, assuming that that, that is possible. Um, well, there are some edge cases there. And then you can run it on the HPC system uh, and, and really kind of extend the portability of Docker to, to really everywhere. So the, the piece that we'll add today with Agave is <coughs> Agave apps are sort of a bundle within themselves, and, and we'll see it. And that bundle includes the, the software, uh, which we can just stick inside of a container. In this case, we'll be sticking with Docker, uh, putting that in there. And then a description about the app itself, what inputs it expects, uh, what kind of outputs it creates, uh, et cetera. And once you have that Agave bundle, 
you can deploy that app uh, within the Cybers infrastructure and it can run anywhere. So if Agave can talk to your execution system, then it can run your app on that execution system and we have a very, very extensible backend to the framework. So that's sort of the flow that we're looking at. All right, and with that, um, I will start to pull in some hands-on examples. So hopefully the font here is okay. Um, I've taken the liberty to uh, make a new directory. So I had the idea that um, I wanted to make a new app, some piece of code, some function that I wanted to perform, uh, encapsulate it as an app and go from there. Um, for this one, I'm just gonna call it an image classifier. Um, so normally I would make a directory, I've already made that here, and I will go into it. Um, there is generally a, a piece of code that um, one would be interested in running. Uh, in this case, and I realize I have a few things that are already a little bit ahead, uh, but in this case, I knew that TensorFlow has a classify image script, it's just a Python script. Um, I have not modified it in any way. Um, we don't need to even know what's in there, but we can just know that as far as parameters, it will uh, take in a, a model directory. It needs to know where the model is that it uses to make predictions. And then it also takes in an image file. In this case, I have an image of a Yorkshire Terrier, uh, which um, we'll be able to see a, a little bit later. I also have an image of a cat. So <coughs> uh, we can then pass these into this image classifier and run it on the machine um, and I, I think that will work here python2 classify image uh, and I will give it a model deer of my current directory with model and I will give it an image file I believe is how it wants it of uh, the Yorkshire Terrier and of course this is gonna going to fail Oh, actually Python 3 will work. So let's just do this. I'm using 3.6 instead of 3.5, but I think it'll still go. Okay, so at the end, it's giving me some warnings because uh, again, I'm not using this exactly in the environment it is. And this is an example of taking a piece of code that's not containerized and running it on a system where it expects Python 3.5 and I have 3.6 and things like that. Um, but in the end, it gave us output. These are the, the prediction scores on what my image was. <clears throat> it was 96.96%. You know, right, I don't think it's a percent, but that's sort of the uh, confidence factor that it's a Yorkshire Terrier, but it also has some other things that will show me sort of the top five predictions of, of what that picture is of. Uh, and, and I get a Yorkie. If I were to change this and do the cat instead, then it would, again, give me similar output. All right, great. So this runs on my own machine, uh, but you know, what if I'm on a machine that might have a different version of Python or doesn't have TensorFlow installed? Then I need something else. You'll see it thinks it's an Egyptian cat. So this is where Docker comes in. And the key ingredients for Docker, uh, well, I've, I've listed them, I think. Yeah, the, the key ingredients are a Docker file that you'll build that includes any code that you care about. Um, let me show you a Docker file. This is sort of the set of requirements. Um, this is very much <laughs> stolen from TensorFlow, so I, I went ahead and exposed some ports that are probably not required, but um, this will at least give you the idea uh, that um, a Docker file is just a way to specify the software that you need. And the key thing that's really cool here, and I'm going to come over to a browser to, to kind of show is that other people already have a lot of stuff that is built for you. So it's a way to very much steal other people's work and not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, Docker runs a hub. This hub has a ton of different images that are, that are available. Um, I can just search for something like TensorFlow. And I'll see that TensorFlow, which is the machine learning package, already has a bunch of containers that have all of their dependencies inside of them. And if you want to have a GPU you know, compatible um, container, you can do that as long as you're using NVIDIA Docker. If you want a CPU only container, then you can have that. And they, they actually keep a bunch of different revisions uh, of, um, 
of their software stack. So you can actually go back in time if you want to run an older version of TensorFlow or if you're, you require an older version of TensorFlow. These containers serve as these time capsules. So even though the version of Python may change over time or the version of TensorFlow may change over time, if the code that you have written depends on version 1.4 for some reason, you can go back and, and grab these containers. And this is, again, part of how containers are solving the portability problem. So <coughs> when I want to create a new container, the, the best way to do that is to start with an old container. So I say from TensorFlow 1.5.0 Py3, which is one I picked, um, you know, bring everything in here, and then take my classify image file and copy it into the container. I'm just putting it at the root directory. Take the model and put it inside of a model directory that's, again, um, right off of the root directory. Uh, I expose some ports just in case we want to do interactive stuff with this container later. That's fine. The work directory says that when I start running a job inside of here, where is it going to start? Well, it'll start in the root. That's fine. And then by default, the command that I care about is I'm going to run Python, which just specifies the interpreter, the, the Python script. And then just like I showed at the command line, it expects a model directory, which is slash model, and then it's going to look for an image file. Um, and then you can just pass that in. So that's sort of the idea behind a Docker file. Um, the point is that it's not that many lines of code. Uh, there are some really great resources, and I have just taken a whole complicated software stack and a few lines and, and, uh, and captured it all. All right, so once you have a Docker file description for some new piece of code, and in this case, really what we're saying is, kind of what I'm theorizing is that classify image would be my new piece of science code that I care about adding. And so I'm putting this inside of an environment that has everything it needs. And then we do a command called docker build. You have to give it a tag. Uh, in this case, usually it's listed with username first, and then a slash, and then the name of the container which in this case it would be image classifier, and then a version like 0 0.1, something like that. And then you tell it the, you know, where the Docker file is that you want to build from. It's in the current directory, which if you're familiar with the command line, can be denoted as a dot or a dot slash. So if I do this, um, it's, it's already using a cache because I've done this, but it, it will take all these pieces and create this layered file and give me an image now that I can use to, to run things. And if I type Docker images, I can see that I have John Fonner image classifier as an image that's available. Um, and then I can run this uh, image in a, in a similar way. So if I, here's my, so here's my Python command that I ran on my own system. Um, I could just as easily say Docker run, um, See, if, if I'm going to use the cat, I need to mount my current directory in there. So I'll say volume mount my current directory into, what do I call it, input. So inside the container, the input directory will contain everything my current directory has. I'll run the image classifier. And in this case, my image file would be in the slash input cat.jpg. I just ran over the edge. So it's, it's thinking I'm, I'm using Python. Uh, the one piece I missed, I need to tell it the image file. So I say Docker run, mount this directory. The image I want to run is John Fonner. Sorry for the typo. Um, image classifier, 0.1. And then the command is Python. Oh, is it? yeah. All right. So uh, this shows me that it worked. Now, this time, and these, these messages might be a little bit different uh, than what I had on my, my host system, because it's not using the Python that's on my host. It's using whatever TensorFlow has inside of their image. And um, it did the same scoring, right? Egyptian cat, tabby cat, all this. But uh, this time, it did it with all the assets that are inside the container.
So um, this, if this is the first time you've seen containers, this can be a little bit mind bending that you're running something that's inside there and um, it, it can be a little bit to get your head around. Uh, but hopefully I'll demonstrate as we continue on with this that what I've done is I've made this piece of code portable now and I have a container that I can reference. All right, so that is a Docker file. Let's see if we've done what we set out to do. We've tested it locally. Um, oh, the last piece is to upload it to Docker Hub. And if you're doing this and following along, typically the first thing you're going to do is, well, the first thing you may do is go to uh, Docker Hub and create an account, um, which is just like creating an account on any other website. Um, but the way that you connect it is you'll say Docker login. Uh, I'm already logged in. <coughs> but this will ask you for your username and password uh, if you need to log in. And then once you have that, you can actually take containers in, that are on your machine and upload them to host, to host them. So if I look at Docker images again, I see John Fawner image classifier. I can then say Docker push, which will push a local container up into the cloud. I'll do that. Um, it may tell me it, it already exists because it does, uh, but that's, that's fine. This is checking for, it's, it's really does this in a smart way. It, it checks, uh, you know, everything is stored in layers. So if you have common layers, it only, it only uploads what is different. Um, yeah, and then once that's uploaded, you can actually go, um, you can go into Docker Hub and look in your account and I'll see that I have an image classifier image that's available, tagged with 0.1, uh, 579 megs. That's just, you know, everything it needs. And, uh, and we're ready to go. So now I have a piece of software that I created up in the cloud uh, that's going to be accessible from anywhere. So that's the container piece. All right, so the next thing we want to do is start working with Agave. <coughs> and uh, at this point, I should come in here and, and we're going to do two things. The first piece of this is that we need an execution system. So if you go to atmo.cyverse.org, uh, this is a, a resource, essentially a cloud resource where you can launch virtual machines that if you have Cyverse, um, you can you either already have access to it or you can just request access to it. You would log in with your same Cyverse credentials as normal and um, you would get a dashboard. From here, you can set up a project, which is just sort of this logical grouping of images and you can ask for a new instance, uh, which I've already done. It's, a, it's just a tiny instance, you know, it's like one core and eight, eight gigs of RAM or something like that. And um, I've called it Agave Execution System. It's built on Ubuntu, Ubuntu 14. Uh, Docker was already installed in this um, virtual machine. Uh, I had to upgrade Python, which was a little bit annoying. Um, but there are, in no way do you need to choose the same um, machine that I chose. And in fact, if, if you end up using Atmosphere, then when you create a new instance, it will ask you for, you know, to search for something that you care about. So if you care about Python 3 or something like that, um, you can go in and search for Python 3 and, and you'll see, you know, here is a, a virtual machine that has Python 3.6 and it's got support for NumPy, Jupyter Notebooks, and Pandas, etc. Um, or if you know that you want Ubuntu as kind of your base, maybe Ubuntu 16, uh, you could do something like that and, uh, and find them. I think Ubuntu is also one of the featured images. All right, so this now gives me something that's running in the cloud. Um, in the case of uh, Atmosphere, I can connect to it through SSH. So I will go ahead and, and do that. <coughs> oh, I need to make this larger. So you just take your iPlant username at the IP address and it will ask you for your password and uh, hopefully I've got mine remembered. Yep. And here I am. I'm now on a virtual machine. This is not my computer. This is a cloud machine. Um, I've already done a little bit of work here in, uh, in downloading Python, but um, other than that, there wasn't a whole lot. Okay. So now I have an execution system 
And now uh, I would be interested in, in working with the Agave API. So the next resource I will point you to, I can get a new tab, is um, cyverse.org slash develop. This is the short URL. <coughs> this actually takes you into um, a frame. The software is hosted on GitHub, so it takes you into a little framed version of this GitHub site. And in this case, we're extending uh, Cyverse, and we want to use the Cyverse SDK. So bring in new tools and resources using the Agave APIs. Um, and here, this will give you a detailed walkthrough of getting started with Cybers and installing the SDK. Make sure you, if there are any you know, the initial assumptions or things that you might need are all taken care of. Um, when it when it comes down to it, this is really just one command. If you already have a, a Mac setup that has a, a decent version of Python and Bash, then for the most part, you'll just say this one command: um, grab this install file and run it. This will add the path to your bash RC file. You just source that and, and then you'll have the CLI available um, and you can test it. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's kind of the idea there. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into that. Uh, I've just done this exact command on this system. Um, in Atmosphere, I also have it on my local system. It doesn't really matter where I show it off, but it creates this directory called the Cyverse CLI. And inside there, there are a bunch of different uh, commands that are used to, to look at the different endpoints, um, the API endpoints that Cyverse exposes. Um, the things that we're gonna be using today, there's a lot in here. And uh, essentially this is a very powerful uh, way to interact with the services. You have a lot of control. Um, we talk about automating tasks as well. Um, if, for example, I want to run, uh, let's say I'll be getting a bunch of different image files um, as part of my research, you know, not all at once, but as things roll on. And every time I get an image file, I want a script that will upload it to the data store and that will run my image classifier app that, that we are going to build. Uh, this is a great way to do it. Um, I could have a script that will uh, files upload my file to the data store and then um, when I want to run a job I can say job submit or jobs resubmit uh, to submit a job that's it's referencing that and I can script this all up so that I never have to look at it again um, so that's sort of the automation bit the pieces that we're going to look at <coughs> uh, are a couple to get us started there's a, a tenants in that clients create and um, an, an authentication step this is the, this is the um, command line equivalent of essentially what you do when you log into the website. And then from there, we will look at systems, uh, which is off the screen, apparently. Um, so we will look at, do this again. We will look at, at creating a system, systems add update. And we'll tell Agave about our, our atmosphere system that we're using as an execution system. And then we will tell it that we have a new app for it. So we'll apps out update. And then from there, we'll be ready to run a job. All right, so that's, that's kind of the, the scope of what this looks like. So I'm gonna switch back to my local machine. It should be this one. So if you're doing this and following along, uh, again, you can, you can follow along with the tutorials on the website on how to log in for the first time, creating a client and doing all that. Um, but I can go over it quickly. So you will initialize you know, which tenant you're talking to. Um, Agave has a, a presence on across multiple things. In this case, we're working with Cybers, what we call iPlant, so we'll say three. And then you would create a new client Clients create, you would give it a name. So maybe my laptop or something like that. Um, and then you would also tell it to store this client inside of a cache. And I'm not going to press enter here, but if you pressed enter, it will just ask you for your username and password to log in and it will give you a client. Um, this is part of the OAuth authentication. And from there you are set to type um, auth tokens create. S, the S is to store it in a cache. 
and it will just ask you for your password. It's at this point, it already uh, knows what your username is. Oh, John? of course I'm gonna get it. Yes. Hi, there's a question. Uh, someone's asking, how did you add the Cyverse-Cly? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this sort of like the, the baking shows. Um, so this, this Cyverse CLI directory, uh, where am I, I need to go to here. This Cyber CLI directory is built if you run this install command. So if you run this on your machine, it will, part of this install script is to make this Cyber CLI and then it installs everything there. And then inside of bash RC, um, it'll have, it'll export the path and it will add this Cyber CLI bin directory to your path. Yep, so totally secret sauce. Thank you for the question. Um, that's a good question. <coughs> okay, and I, uh, I'm not sure if I should be concerned about this. So I'm gonna spy. Okay, great. I think when I did tenants init, I blew away my client. That's okay. So I will do the client's create step. Store it. The name will be my laptop. Username, Jay Foner, password, thankfully hidden. Um, there's my key in secret, which after the call, I'll be changing. <laughs> and then uh, now I can say auth tokens create and store. Uh, again, I need my password this time, but the point is once I have a token that I won't need it anymore. Again, I'll replace that. Um, those tokens last for like four hours and then they change. Um, and you can um, always refresh the token. All right, so now I can, I can use that whole list of commands that I was referencing before, all the auth stuff and the system stuff and all that um, I can use. So, um, all right, so here's my, my image classifier. Um, what do I want to do? Okay, the first piece of this is gonna be registering the system. So we have some convenient scripts for this. And it, the idea is that if you're on the system that you wanna register, so in this case, I'm on the Atmosphere VM that I care about. Uh, there is a command that is Cyverse um, Atmo create. And this is a little utility script that will register an Atmosphere virtual machine. Um, and as it does so, it's gonna walk me through the, the pieces that it needs. It's going to make sure that I have a current token, so it's going to refresh it for me. So again, I'm not doing this on my local laptop. I'm doing this on the atmosphere piece that I care about. Um, and then it's going to tell me that I need a few pieces of information. I'll need the either host name or IP address. Um, I'll need a, a directory and a system name and username and password. So do I have all the required information? Yes. My username is not found, it's, it's Jay Foner. Um, my Cyverse account password, uh, which it, this is hidden, I can type it, I'm not going to. Oh. Well, I guess I, I have to type something. But if you're following along, you can do this. Um, I've already done it, so I'm not, uh, I'm actually gonna cancel out of this command right before the end. So Jay Foner, I'll pass in a password that's not my password. Um, it's gonna ask me for an IP address. If you're using Atmosphere, then this IP address is, uh, is here. Um, and you guys can't use mine. This, this, the only person who can log in to your machines on Atmosphere is, is your Cyverse username. Um, but in this case, I would copy this and, uh, and paste it in. Um, it'll ask me for where I want Agave to put data when it's running things. In this case, home JFoner is perfect. It's on a VM. If you're on a different system, you might have a different place to put it. So I'll press enter. And then it's gonna ask me for what I wanna call this. Um, system names are unique across the entire tenant. So if, you know, whoever's first can register a system, oops, uh, can register a system called Cyverse Atmo, but after that it'll be taken. So it'll expect this to be unique. And I've actually already registered this system um, before the class, so I'll have it available. So at this point, I'm gonna hit control C to exit out of the script. But for everyone else, if you press enter, 
or type in a new name, um, it will go ahead and go through the motions of registering this system with Agave. So now I can do uh, a systems list command and give it this, uh, I'll, I'll say verbose, and give it the name of my system. <coughs> and I'll see that it's done a whole bunch of stuff for me. Um, it's written this JSON description. Um, JSON is a JavaScript object notation. It's, it's a very web-friendly way of talking back and forth, and it's what, it's, it's what Agave interacts with. So most of the time that's hidden, but if you use the dash V flag, it'll show you the underlying JSON. But it's done a bunch of work for me to say that this is a command line uh, you know, system that you will just uh, fork a process on to run something, and you just connect to it via SSH. Um, on port 22, and this is the host ID, and this is the paths and all that. Okay, great. So at this point, I actually have a execution system that was previously not part of Cyverse that I've extended Cyverse to include. And so the last piece of this is to go ahead and, and to register an app on that. So I'm gonna go back to my local machine, because that's where I develop. Um, you guys could do it differently. And all I've done is, if, if the directory I'm in is where I'm building my Docker file, then I'm going to put a subdirectory <coughs> with the name of what I want to call this app. So in this, you know, if you're following along, you would make dear uh, image classifier 0 0.1, um, which, I've, which I've already done. And then, so I'm just going to go inside there. So the, the layout of this, the, the pieces that we need are fairly simple. Um, inside the test directory, I'm going to be nice and I'm going to put a image that you can, that someone could use as an example. Uh, I'm going to put a test script that's just a shell script that would actually run this. It's essentially the Python command I showed you earlier. Um, and then I'll show it at the end, but I'm going to, to also put in here, just being a good citizen, a example job submission scripts to actually run this app. The other pieces that it needs are a wrapper script, which I'm going to show you and then an explanation to Agave of how to use my app. Uh, so hopefully this will make sense. But um, first of all, let me look at this wrapper script. It's, it's gonna be short. Oh, in fact, I don't even need this, um, this line. So all it's gonna do is do two things. First of all, the piece of my app that's going to change is the image file that people are using. Um, it doesn't have to be, this is what I defined. So I could also support using different models if that's you know, part of the research question that I wanted to ask. So I could let people define a model directory and then support that. But in this case, I'm going to make the model part of my software bundle that lives inside the container. And the only piece that people are going to change is the image file. Um, if there were other parameters that I wanted to include, then I would probably just list them here as a, as a variable. And if you're familiar with bash, <coughs> this might not make a lot of sense, but um, I'm, I'm essentially signing a one bash variable to another. Uh, the, the key here though is as long as image file is defined as a variable in bash, the script will work. And then this is the same docker run command that I used earlier. I say docker run, I will volume mount my current directory as input. Um, I will specify the image to use, which is John Fawner image classifier 0.1. I can be confident that this is available anywhere because it's on Docker Hub. So I can, you know, it can be pulled down anywhere. And then the command that I want to use is, uh, is right here, Python classify image, model directory, image file. And the only piece that I changed, and unfortunately it wraps, the line wraps around. Um, but the only piece that I've changed here is that instead of specifying cat.jpg or yorkshireterrier.jpg, um, I've just said input, image file as a variable. So what will happen now is I can tell Agave that to run my app, I need an image file. And then users can select their own image file that will have its own name. That name will get populated here when I run my script. And so whenever I run it, and it, it mounts that, you know, the, the host directory into the container, um, that image file, whatever the user has specified, will magically be in this input directory. Uh, and, and I can run it. So in this case, you can actually test this on the command line on your local machine. Um, I'm not going to do it because I know I'm running short on time. But uh, that is essentially the, 
the uh, piece that, um, that Agave is doing. I won't, I won't change it. All right, so the last piece is I need to tell Agave about this and upload it. <coughs> Not in that order. Um, when you're building an app.json, the, the best thing that I can say is that in the same um, developer portal, there's a whole section on, on building an app, so developing an application for Cyverse. And this has a great example of uh, what the JSON file looks like. It's not that much fun to build by hand. Uh, it's actually what I did. Um, it, it only took a few minutes. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially tell Agave, okay, all this wrapper script and, and all the files that are part of my application, uh, I'm going to put them somewhere. In this case, I'm going to put them in I, the iPlant data store. And I'm going to put them inside my home directory. I've got a subdirectory called applications. And I've just made a directory called image classifier. Uh, you can use the discovery environment to set this up, or you can use the CLI. Uh, I want this app to actually run on my atmosphere execution system that I just created. And um, then I can also give it some defaults for the computational resources that this needs. In this case, it's very modest. I'm just specifying small numbers and, uh, and going there. Most of the rest of this, help UI label, a lot of this is just metadata that is that we use for discovery of the apps and things like that. It, it really doesn't matter what you put. The, the piece that's going to matter, oh, you can see I stole this from a SAM tool, so I have a, the short description is not right. Um, the only piece that's going to matter are the sort of technical specifications of how to run your app. And Agave cares about inputs and parameters. Um, inputs are files, and parameters are anything that's not a file. So if you have like a, uh, a number as a parameter, like you know, um, how many cores you want to use or something, or uh, what the what a cutoff or something is. You can just specify that as a parameter, and they can, you know, type in the number, and that'll get passed in. So in this case, I'm telling Agave that I have an input that is required, and uh, I want Agave to call it image file. You'll notice this is the same name as the variable that's in my wrapper script. And the user can specify whatever they want. By default, I can give them this path. This is my little uh, test image, right? This is where it's going to end up living once I upload it. And um, <coughs> I should have given it a, a better label here at the bottom. All right, so this is the uh, image, image to classify, for example. And, and that's really it. Um, I don't have any parameters for this. All I need is to, to specify a file. So at this point, I have in this directory kind of a minimal set. I have that two-line or three-line bash script that'll run it that specifies uh, input file as a, or image file as a input. Right, make sure, image file. I have the app.json, which again is calling image file, the ID of the thing that's coming in. So when I register this app, um, I would say apps, actually the first thing I would do is upload this. So files upload uh, my current directory to uh, jfoner applications um, image classifier 0 0.1. Did I type it all right? Maybe not if it's creating the uh, thing. Um, I can show you this to you, by the way. Everything I'm doing in, in the command line is also reflected in the web app, like the discovery environment. If you're familiar with it, here's what the discovery environment looks like. So if I go to my home directory under applications, I have an image classifier directory, and inside there, I've already uploaded my, my app and my wrapper. Okay, so now my app assets are somewhere that Agave knows about. <coughs> um, I can register my app, which would be app add update. Oh, sorry, apps add update. Give it my JSON script as a file. It successfully added this app, JFoner image classifier 0 0.1. And the last piece of this is to go ahead and test it with data. Um, again, in sort of the the baking show uh, method, I already have a, a job.json file. If I were doing this from scratch, 
then I would do a couple of things. Um, I could either do this inside of the discovery environment. Oh goodness. As the discovery environment has an issue, hopefully I haven't dropped off. Um, or I could do this through the command line, um, where I would say jobs template to give me a, a JSON template and tell it that the app that I care about is, um, is the one that I just created, JFON or image classifier. And this would give me a job JSON file. Um, I've already edited that. So I will just open what I have. And you'll see most of this is just saying how much runtime I want, but um, it will ask me what app I want to run, what I want to call my job script. And in this case, the only other real piece is um, the, the image file that I want to specify. Uh, this will archive it back uh, when it's done, if I set this to true. So in this case, I'm using that Yorkshire Terrier example again that we've uploaded to the, the data store. And now I could say job submit, this job.json file. And off it'll go. Um, at that point, I now have an ID for this job submission that I can track. This is the same thing the discovery does. We're just sort of peeking behind the curtain. So I could ask for the history of this job. <coughs> we'll see that it's accepted and queued for submission. Um, and if I look at my virtual machine, um, you know, wherever I, wherever I told Agave it could use, in this case, home jfauner, it's going to put a little subdirectory that's got my username in there or the username of whoever's running the job. And um, once it's ready to run, it, it archives when it's done. And, and uh, if I turn archive off, it'll leave it there. But it'll create little temporary directories in here to actually run the app. Okay, as the DE... Uh, Falls on me. The last little piece that I wanted to do, and it looks like the DE might be under maintenance or something, um, was to show that the output of that file will show up um, in the, the discovery environment, in the uh, you know archive back to the data store, and uh, and do all that. Okay, was there another piece? No, this was the piece. So let me. I've thrown a lot at people. Let me sort of rehash what what we've talked about, and then from that point, I'll take some questions. So the take home messages are this. Um, that Cyverse is a multifaceted infrastructure that is built around being able to adapt and uh, to, to the type of problem that needs to be solved and let developers sort of implement what they need to implement to get the job done. Um, there are user interfaces for working with it interactively that are, are pretty nice. There are also some interfaces, and I realize given the time constraint and the ambition of the content that it's uh, been drinking from a fire hose. But there are some command line tools that make working with the science APIs also reproducible in a scriptable way. Um, that as you do this, you can deploy your own systems uh, using something like convenience script. We have an example um, like that Cyverse Atmo create. That was an example of creating a virtual machine. It's not actually specific to atmosphere. It, it'll work on any VM system that could be Amazon as long as you have SSH access or Jetstream or something that's a part of your own academic um, resources. Uh, we have examples of registering HPC systems. So we have, we run uh, hundreds of jobs um, a month through uh, Stampy2 and Lone Star 5 and these big HPC systems provide to provide really scalable resources for apps that are CPU hungry or memory intensive or IO intensive or that need GPUs for example. Um, and all that is expandable. Um, in, a, in the course of the Cyverse project, you know, we've had, oh, probably eight different HPC systems or so that we have put apps on, and we can migrate apps from one system to another, and all that can happen behind the scenes fairly seamlessly uh, because of the way that we can just extensively add new resources to the, the infrastructure. Um, we've talked about containers and the portability they provide. If you know that your execution, uh, I'm sorry, if you know that your execution system will run your code without a container. You don't have to use containers, but we definitely promote this as a, as a best practice for deploying software. And then from there, we looked at uh, actually running things within um, the Agave system, and uh, it, was, it was a bit fast, whoops. It was a bit fast, but hopefully it, it gave everyone an idea of how to get it going. 
All right, with that, um, Tina, I'll hand back over to you and, and ask for any questions and we'll go from there. Maybe I can look at the job progress while we're, while we're going. Great. John, thanks. Wonderful presentation. Are there any other questions for John? If so, um, type them in the chat. Or if it's a pretty small group, I might be able to promote you to a panelist so you can speak if your question is a little bit um, too complicated for a, a quick type in. Otherwise, you're always welcome to email support at cybers.org if there is a question, and we'll direct that to the right person. Um, doesn't look like there are any other questions for now. John, you did a really thorough job. Um, and I don't know, we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, like I said, these materials are <coughs> posted to the website that's listed on the chat. And I'll also follow up to all the registrants with an email that has our follow-up survey as well as this wiki page. So, um, okay, John, no, no further questions. Is there any parting bits of wisdom you want to share with us? Oh, um, yeah, sure. So if you decide to deploy apps, uh, you should not feel like you're alone. Um, there are, you know, there's a community of uh, at this point, it's dozens of, of active developers at a time, people sort of cycle in and cycle out, um, that are working on things that are, are really varied. Uh, there is a, um, and, and this is actually linked inside of here, there is a Slack, communi uh, Slack communication channel that you can join. The Agave developers, um, and a lot of Cybers folks, including myself, are part of this Slack channel. This is open. And so if you decide to do this, I would say join this channel. This is a great way to informally ask questions and get um, near real-time feedback, you know, depending on who's on. And the people that are answering, it's cool. It's you know, both people that are involved in Cyverse and also developers that are not involved in Cyverse that um, tend to volunteer and field questions. Um, the other place that is always great to ask is like the, the Ask Forum um, that's part of iPlant, uh, ask.cyverse.com or cyverse.org if, it, if it's moved over. Um, and this is a great place where you can just ask quick questions and get various answers. Uh, you can also search for questions. You know, if you're searching about agave, you'll see various things that people have run into or, or questions they've had about um, using the resources. So uh, it's exciting. I love developing that way. And um, hopefully it will, it will help you. I see a question here. It yes. says, right. so the DE does not run a Docker engine. We must have some other computing resource that runs Docker. Um, no, not true. The, the point of this demonstration is the extensibility of uh, the platform. So I wanted to actually show bringing in a resource that's not part of um, Cyverse. There is a tool integrator that's also within the discovery environment that will use a, a local Condor cluster that does support Docker. Um, this is part of the reason that we push containerization on, on all fronts. Uh, and you can use that if the, as long as the compute times that you need are fairly modest uh, and the resources, you know, to run safely on one node, my image classifier example would be a perfect case where I don't actually need to look for outside execution resources to run it. Um, but there are examples that uh, you definitely would um, want to do that. Um, you know, if, if it's a large parallel job, if it has a long runtime, things like that, that won't work for the, the existing resources. Great. Great, thank you everybody. Right, that's all I've got. Our time is up and uh, please stay tuned to your email. We'll be emailing you further uh, with information from this webinar. Thank you, John. Bye everybody. Great, thank you, bye.